Great, let's get straight into it. Now, uh, you've preached widely about peace and non-partisanship uh, for traditional rulers throughout elections. Uh, but tell me, what is the exact role that you feel you will play uh, in the road up to the elections? Well, for me personally, um, I cannot speak on other traditional rulers in other places where things are, are slightly different in each kingdom as you move through each kingdom. For me personally, um, I know that traditional rulers should not be paying direct partisan politics. Um, as a monarch, I have people who are in APC, I have sons and daughters who are in PDP. As a result of that, I try to keep myself as neutral as possible. Of course, one thing that I will not do and that I have not done is to know a person and know that the person might not be good or know the person is actually very, very good and I will not speak out. I believe it's very, very important if we know that leaders are not going to help the situation because we are in an extremely sensitive situation as it is now in Nigeria. We need the traditional rulers to speak out. It might not necessarily be publicly, but to their subjects. They need to be as honest as possible and they need to be honest to the politicians. Politicians are not magicians. Uh, politicians uh, do not have knowledge of everything. They are human beings just like the rest of us. They make mistakes. Um, some of them need the advice from family, friends. Let's not encourage our politicians to do anything that they wish, to, to carry on politics as usual. We need a different type of politics now and I believe that traditional rulers are in a situation and in a position that they should be able to talk truth to power. No, no matter what the situation is. Now, earlier this year, you advised the All Progressives Congress and the PDP to guard against bitter rivalry and bloodshed in the build-up and during the 2023 general elections. But of course, we're already seeing some controversies coming up even before the campaign start. We have the controversy of the Muslim-Muslim ticket of the APC. We also have the controversy of the fight between Governor Yesom Wike and um, Senator Yocha, are you? What are your thoughts on all these issues and how can voters not get involved in what some people have termed distractions and actually face the real issues? There's absolutely no possibility of the voters not getting involved in all of these issues that you've just mentioned. Now, voters are going to be sensitive to their leaders. If there is a crisis at the top, that crisis is certainly going to affect all of us, the nationwide. So, as it is now, we need our politicians in this very, very sensitive time to do some personal reflection. If Nigeria goes, we all go. There is no rich person that will survive financially the bankruptcy of this country. We just can't afford it. Nigeria is too large to fail. We cannot allow this nation to fail. How does a nation that has produced so many colossal giants across the world in every field, how do we fail? How do we go abroad and are successful and we come back to Nigeria and we fail? There comes a time where we need to tell ourselves the truth. And that simple truth is, Whoever is not politically ready to make sacrifices, because being a leader is about making sacrifices. Whoever is not politically ready to make sacrifices, you should not be standing up to say that you wish to lead the people. The present PDP crisis, the present crisis in APC, these are things I can talk privately to my friends and those that I know. For example, somebody like uh, Okowa and Atiku, these are two people that I know have a listening ear. I have the experience of working with Okowa for well over 20 years now, and I know he has a listening ear. I cannot talk on those that I do not know, but those that I do know, I ask them fervently, let us change the formula. The formula that we have for Nigeria right now is not working. We can't continue like this. It's not sustainable. Very well said. The formula is indeed not working. Now, one of the issues that has been 
raised by ANEC and also election observers is the issue of vote buying. Like what we saw in the Oshu and Ekiti state elections. I'm wondering what role you think um, traditional rulers should play in enlightening the enlightening their you know community the members of their community so that they know the true cost of selling their votes and in, in i think this would also translate to better judgment when votes are being cast if traditional rulers take their place in terms of enlightenment and i'd like to know your thoughts on that i'll give you my thoughts on that quite easily uh, my thoughts are i miss oba Arediwa. I miss Sijuwade. These were traditional rulers who I grew up around. When I came back to Nigeria, I was a young monarch. I was brought up by Emir Bayero, Sijuwade Oniovife, and Eredua Obaya Benin. And I know that had these men been alive now, as is very, very clearly being shown with the example of Emir Bayero, they would have had so much to say to our leaders privately. And I know that these leaders had a great deal of respect for these men. I am not taking anything away from my brothers who are currently there, but the current Unio Vifa and the current Oba of Benin, you've got to understand they're very new to the system and they're going to take some time before they're able to integrate and the nation needs to give them that time. Buying of votes, how do you explain it to the electorate? How do you explain to an electorate who have never seen dollars before that they shouldn't take dollars? The dollarization of our politics is destroying the nation. It's destroying the economy. If we want others to respect our currency, if we want others to respect our Naira, we have to respect it first and foremost. We have to respect it. What has dollars got to do with our current political situation? I wish that this money being spent were in Naira. We must have put value into our Naira. The Naira, any country's currency is a reflection of the value of that nation. Our value is going down every day. But yet still, I know that Nigerians are worth more than what we're seeing right now. To put the onus on the traditional rulers might not be completely fair. Traditional rulers, once again, cannot speak out publicly where it concerns party issues. I know a number of my brothers have privately done as much as they can to speak to some of these politicians, and we will continue to do so. And I thank God that there has not been a total breakdown between the traditional rulers and the political class. There is still a very, very good bond between them. But I would like to encourage my brothers that even if it's in private, you need to be honest with the politicians. Unfortunately, I've seen it again and again in Nigeria that so-called big men, when you are in a position of leadership, sometimes you can be so busy with what you see in front of you around you becomes very murky and very blurred. Once again, these are not supermen. They sleep, they get sick, they get tired. Please, all of you who are surrounding our big men, all of you who are surrounding our top politicians, be truthful to them. Tell them the honest to God truth. We are in a critical situation in the country right now. And if we do not get things right, I fear for the country. So we must be able to shun some of these things that we've done in the past that I think we all clearly know do not work. We're not moving forward. We might move sideways, we might move round in circles, but we're yet to move forward. And I find that very disheartening in a country that I believe has produced some of the top intellectuals, not just in Africa, but internationally. We need to change the way we're doing things. You've raised, you've raised several profound points, um, but I'd like to backtrack to um, you paying homage to the older generation 
uh, of traditional rulers. And uh, I'm interested to know whether you feel with the new generation that has come about, a couple of weeks ago, we saw you celebrating with the Olu of Wari. Do you feel there is possibly a need to modernize the role of traditional rulers so that we can begin to engage the youth, the young society, who are being utilized in a lot of these uh, political shenanigans? If you don't modernize, you die. It's as simple as that. Presidency is a modernization of monarchy. The presidential system, the prime ministerial systems, government systems as we have them now, they all modernized from monarchies, did they not? So this is where we are. Every day we modernize. You cannot stay stagnant. I continue to say man is not meant to serve tradition. Tradition is meant to serve man. If you have an outdated tradition, for example, the way we treat women, it's very outdated. It's very disrespectful. How do you take women who give birth to we as men and we continue to deny them simple rights? For any nation that does not respect its women, we cannot move forward. If you do not respect the very vessel that brings you into this world, the vessel which the Almighty God, the Almighty Allah, in His wisdom, chose to bring all our prophets and all our biggest and most successful men through, how do you move forward? So, there are many things that need to be modernized. Our youth you mentioned the Ulu of Wari, a brother that I am very, very proud of. I will support him anywhere. I will continue to support him. I supported him throughout the situation that came about in Wari. I was not happy about it at the time because I know that the Ulu of Wari's father personally told me that he wanted his son to take over the throne. And I thank God that as it was meant to be, it has come to be now. If we look at this young Olu of Wari, he's doing an amazing job. I think the younger generation of traditional rulers will still come to do that amazing job. But one of the critical things that I'm quite concerned about is actually the gulf between the youth and the elders. We cannot allow for this gulf to continue. The elders need the youths, and the youths need the wisdom of the elders. I don't know where I would exactly be today if I did not have these old men. And as I mentioned these old men, I should also mention that Ulu of Wari was, was very profound in my life as well, the former Ulu of Wari. I learned many things from the former Ulu of Wari. So we need our elders and we need our youths. We cannot separate them from each other. I keep on telling youths, any youth that disrespects an elder, wait, one day you will be an elder. Will you want to be disrespected? At the same time, I say to our elders, take it easy. The youths don't want you to go, but there comes a time in your life as an elder, you must be willing to give way for the youth. Elders don't go to war. They plan the wars. They orchestrate the wars. But they are not the ones that fight on the battlefield. They are not the ones that lose their lives. We need to respect our youth. We don't need to spoil them with money and weapons. We need to get away from the current situation that we're in desperately in Nigeria right now. Well, earlier you talked about traditional rulers being neutral, impartial, and fair to all. But we've seen cases of some traditional rulers endorsing candidates and even directing their subjects on how to vote. If not, they will face dire consequences, probably like perishing in the lagoon within seven days. How did we get here? How do we reverse this trend so that we can maintain and respect the sanctity of these roles you know, that our traditional rulers occupy? Well, first and foremost, I think that every people and every kingdom needs to be very careful who they're bringing up as a monarch, as a traditional ruler. We do not need a situation where our traditional rulers are placing themselves in harm's way. 
um, to be dabbling directly into politics, you leave yourself very, very open to a number of things that could happen. I mean, whether we like it or not, we saw what happened in Cana. It, it was a very unfortunate situation. We thank God that it has been resolved and the, this, the kingdom and its, and its state has been able to move forward. But where you have a situation where traditional rulers are directing their citizens or their, their subjects where to vote, what happens if you lose that vote? I know of a candidate that came to see me at one point that told me of a traditional ruler that refused to see him. And I know how that candidate felt. And I know what that candidate said to me. And had that candidate won, things would not have gone well for that traditional ruler. Why would you want to place yourself in that, in that situation? I'm free to see any political party I wish. And I will pray for them accordingly. And if I do not think that you are moving in the right direction, I will do what I've done for 22 years. I will sit down with you respectfully and privately and I will give you my opinion. I can only give you my opinion. You are a man. You are a woman. You will decide for yourself what you do with my opinion. But I will give you my opinion. And I will always base my opinion on not what is directly best for me, but what is best for the nation. We all need to think about what is best for the nation. That is the important thing right now. Understand, the goose that lays the golden egg is what is important, not the golden egg. If we refuse to take care of the goose that lays the golden egg, that goose will continue to get skinnier, sicker, and the golden eggs will continue to get smaller and smaller until I suppose some people will then say we should eat the goose that lays the golden egg. At the point that we've finished that goose that lays the golden egg, where did the rest of the eggs come from? We need to be smart. We need to move forward. Enough of this going backwards. We need to move forward. Enough of this rivalry. This is why myself and Duolu of Wari, myself and the Emir of Kanu, we are visiting the north. We are visiting other parts of the country. We're doing this as our roles as traditional rulers to make sure that if our people see us together, then maybe, just maybe, we can put down some of these rivalries. Many people do not understand why harems, why kings had harems. Kings did not have harems because their libidos were high. That's the wrong reason. We had more than one wife because we married from different areas. For instance, if we were in war times now, if myself and the Emir of Kanu were warring, our two kingdoms were warring, well, if I marry the Emir of Kanu's daughter, can our kingdoms go to war anymore? No, they cannot. And whether you like it or not, this is what happened in Europe. Europe was at one time embroiled in constant conflicts. But by the time they started to intermarry, by the time they started to have these very strong unions and relationships, they found that it would be better to get along than to be fighting. Once again, we are in a very sensitive position right now where our nation is concerned. I am begging, actually, I am begging our politicians. Let's get this right. I don't know a dumb politician in this country. Every politician that I've spoken to in this country are exceptionally bright people. They know what's good for them. If you're able to know what's good for you, then you should be able to know what's good for your brother. Let us start being our brother's keeper. Enough of this nonsense because it is nonsense. We are an amazing nation. We are an amazing people. Let's use our diversity to our benefit. Let's not make it something that should destroy us. But thank you very, very much. Thank you as well. Now, earlier on when I asked you about vote buying, you rightly pointed out that it would be unfair, you know, to put the onus on traditional rulers. And that's the premise for my next question. I'm wondering how impressed you are 
with the level of collaboration that you've seen with traditional rulers when it comes to security operatives, INEC representatives and other stakeholders ahead of the 2023 elections to make it successful or reflective of what you would like to see play out? Well, it's not a matter of what I would personally like to see play out. It's what we should all want to see play out. Look, I'm tired of us doing what we want to do in Nigeria. Then the same people that do not want to follow the traffic rules, that do not want to follow the laws and regulations of Nigeria, we go to America and as soon as we get off the plane, we're not shouting anymore, we're not abusing each other anymore. There is no single Nigerian that can go to America and insult a police officer. You do that and you will spend a night in jail. But we come back to Nigeria, we hear a police siren blaring and we stay in the, in the way of the police. That's called obstruction of justice. When are we going to start respecting ourselves? We cannot go to England and America and suddenly we become perfect citizens. But then the same country that we call our own, we get back here on the plane and as soon as we get to the airport, we're insulting each other, we're berating each other. We're not talking. And I believe that one of the things that traditional rulers can do is to foster that communication between ourselves. What you've seen the Emir of Kanu do. I mean, the Emir of Kanu, he came here for Unduka, Baibuna's mother's uh, uh, burial. He did not go to the burial because traditionally Muslims will not do so. But he flew in to give that support to Unduka Baibuna. He flew back out, then flew back in again for the program that he had with the Ulu of Wari. If that is not dedication, to southern Nigeria, if that is not the Emmy of Kanu showing, I want peace. And that's why myself and the Ulu of Wari, we didn't have the necessary time. We had to fly to Kanu for the wedding. We stayed a few hours and we came back. Why? To show solidarity. So that the northerners saw two powerful first class, traditional rulers, young monarchs from southern Nigeria attending with them as our brothers. I am trying to learn how to pray as a Muslim because I must respect my Muslim brothers. And to all my Muslim brothers that are watching, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You're very, very welcome. What we need is peace. If you are a true Christian, go and read the Quran. If you are a real Muslim, well, almost all the Muslims that I do know know the Christian Bible better than some of us as Christians. You must be tolerant. The Quran teaches that both the Jews, the Christians, will all go to Jannah, will all go to heaven. So those who are promoting this very, very sadistic form of religion, and it does not come from just one side, we have seen Christianity at its worst in the past. So anybody who is teaching violence from Islam, that is not Islam. Islam is, a, is a, a religion of peace. Do not get it wrong. A peaceful man is not going to be peaceful all the time. If you pull the tail of a tiger, expect to get bitten. But right now, I think too many tigers in the forest. We need more lambs. We need peace right now. The bloodshed in the country, the insecurity, it has driven away all of our international funding. Nobody's going to want to come and do business here if we cannot do business with ourselves. This country should look like Dubai. Why doesn't this country look like Dubai? Slowly, slowly, I can see that the Ulu of Wari will soon make Wari look like Dubai. Going to Kanu, I saw the development there, I was amazed. Let's put our efforts together. Enough of this shouting at each other. Don't shout at me, communicate with me. For as long as we're shouting, we're not hearing each other's views. And if we do not listen and appreciate each other's views, you do not need to agree with my view, but you should appreciate my view. Without this, our nation is doomed. And I do not want to believe that this country this powerful country 
this amazing country can ever see do. By God's grace, it will not be our portion. Well, amen. And thank you so much, Your Royal Majesty, Dr. Benjamin Ikenchuku, Dane of Agbo. We do appreciate your presence here on Newsday. Thank you very, very much.